Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us, whether you're here on the campus of the George Washington University or watching around the country or actually around the world. Uh, we're thrilled you could join us for this citizen event. This is the fourth in a series of in-person citizen events that CNN is partnering with the George Washington University on doing right here uh, on the George Washington campus. It is uh, part of a partnership that CNN and GW have, which also includes the uh, brand new Ted Turner professorship here at the School of Media and Public Affairs, which uh, will be uh, introduced uh, later this fall. So we're thrilled to work with G GW, and we're thrilled that all of you have joined us tonight. Uh, to those watching around the country, um, please look out for other citizen events, particularly as we move towards the midterm election. Uh, visit CNN.com slash citizen for information on future events, and we'll have quite a number of them as the as election day draws near. So speaking of election day, we are only six weeks away from a really critical midterm election. Uh, I think it's, I think we can all agree that this election and this election season is turning out to be an awful lot more interesting than any of us had ever expected, uh, which means that you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, tonight, we will not only talk about what to expect in the election, but we really want to focus on what's driving the voters. Let's get behind the numbers and figure out what it is that's moving moving the electorate. Um, will it be inflation, as Republicans hope, or will it be abortion, for example, as Democrats hope? These are the questions that we in the CNN political team talk about amongst ourselves uh, all day long, but today you're going to get an opportunity to peer in on the, on the conversation with a terrific group uh, from our team right here uh, on this stage. So without further ado, I want to introduce your moderator for the evening, Please welcome to the stage CNN's anchor and chief, chief national affairs analyst and perhaps for this crowd, most important, proud alumna of the George Washington University. Please welcome Casey Hunt. Sam, um, and thanks to all of you for uh, spending your Wednesday evening uh, with us. I am actually really thrilled to be back here. I also attended many political events here um, in the Jack Morton Auditorium. So it's really nice uh, to be home again. And I'm really excited because we've got a great group of people here to have this conversation with. Um, Gloria Borger is CNN's chief political analyst. She plays an instrumental role in our daily coverage on all kinds of political and breaking news stories. Gloria. Um, <laughs> she also covers midterm presidential elections, congressional investigations, lots of Donald Trump, you name it, Gloria blah, blah, does it. Blah. <laughs> Um, we also have David Chalian. He is the vice president of our political coverage and our political director. <laughs> David oversees all of our daily political coverage, the polling, uh, our decision desk operations. And obviously, if you flip on CNN, you are very likely to catch him on air in front of our uh, magic wall of some sort explaining whatever is going on on any given day. He's always my first call when I you know, need help with something or, or have a set of questions. He is, he is the go-to. Jasmine Wright is a White House reporter with CNN. <laughs> Jasmine now covers the White House. She was a political embed for us in the 2020 presidential election. She followed then Senator Kamala Harris during the Democratic primary campaign, uh, and then she was an embed uh, when Harris was on the vice presidential ticket with Joe Biden. So welcome to everyone. Thank you. Um, we are, like I was telling these guys, we're all thrilled uh, thrilled to be here, and I think Sam uh, did a really nice job of setting the stage for us, uh, because I know David. Before um, you know, we as we were getting ready to to do all of this, um, we were sort of talking about, okay, how should we approach this midterm election? Because it feels so different than midterm elections in the past, mostly because it doesn't seem to be about a single thing, like like a one single topic. And and often they are. There are a referendum on the the party in power, or there's you know one overriding issue. I think we all went into this thinking that, that that would be the economy, and that's just not how it's turning out to be. Break it down for right. us. Well, for some voters, it is right, and then so there, the the election is, can be the election can be about a single thing for some voters. But what is what Case is getting at that I think is so fascinating at this particular moment in time, seven weeks out, is that that single thing can be different uh, depending on who you are. And obviously, there's always when we ask folks sort of what issue is driving you. Uh, what's the most important issue in this election to you? You get a range of answers, but midterms usually do huddle around like one sort of topic. And what we're seeing is that there is this issue-driven campaign about the inflation, the economy, immigration, and crime that is driving the Republican side of the equation in American politics. And 
on the other side, we are seeing abortion rights or the very foundations of our democracy and trying to uh, protect that. Uh, those are issues that are driving democratic campaigns. And so to me, the big question that we have facing us as we cover this over the next many weeks is, which one of those campaigns, as we get closer to election day and voters are making their decisions, proves to be the dominant one and the most persuasive one, especially for those folks in the middle? You know, what, what's so interesting to me is that usually, as you were saying, it's a referendum on the incumbent. And what the Democrats are saying is, no, 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 it's not a referendum on the incumbent, it's a referendum on Republicans. It's a referendum on extremism. And what the Democrats are trying to do is play in the culture wars. This is, you know, Republicans have always been quite adept and done it very well playing on the culture wars. And you see that in this election um, with immigration, for example. But the Democrats now are saying, wait a minute, uh -uh, we have abortion here, which is working in our favor. Also, for example, health care. Health care is their issue. And they can play on that. And so they now believe they have some equity there, and they're trying to push that, even though everybody knows, as James Carville once said, it's the economy, <laughs> stupid. And so it's, it's, you know, candidates have to, Democratic candidates have to kind of try and balance this. How much love do you give Joe Biden um, versus how independent are you? And what issues do you emphasize in what part of the country? So, Jasmine, let me bring you in here because, I mean, you cover the White House every day. You're always talking uh, to, to Biden's team, to Harris's team. I mean, how do they view it, especially this question of the president himself? Because it is a tough question for a lot of Democratic candidates. Do you want to appear with President Biden considering his approval rating? It's, it's, it's ticked up lately, but it's not great. Yeah, well, I think if you look at the president's most recent travels, he was just in Pennsylvania, and then you saw him with Fetterman, and that was a question going into that event of whether or not he would appear, um, whether or not some of these candidates who are in some of these trickier races would flock to Biden. Uh, of course, you heard Tim Ryan running for Ohio Senate saying that, you know, it's time for new leadership, but across the board, we're not seeing total um, a rebuke of Biden, and, and I think you can look at that because of some of the policies that you have seen the White House get passed in the last few weeks when you talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, of course, a few months ago when you talk about the bipartisan infrastructure, when you talk about their work on abortion rights, trying to uh, really send the message that they uh, feel that the Supreme Court met, took too many steps, went too far when they took away what they see as the constitutional right. So I think that you are seeing more Democrats at least warm up to the idea that maybe we should tout all of the things that President Biden has done for the country, all the things that he's gotten passed. But I think if you look at the president specifically <laughs> and how he is approaching this election, it's exactly what you talked about, Gloria, that extremism, right? He is making it a referendum, not on himself so much of what he's done in office, but on President Trump former President Trump, even though he is not on the ballot, you see him <laughs> taking those really grand um, condemnations of former President Trump in front of, in, in, in speeches that they say, well, th this is not gonna be political, right? And in ways saying that this is the very fabric of democracy unraveling that his uh, followers are motivated by semi-fascism. So you're seeing the, the president really take it head on, trying to shift some of the focus from maybe the inflation's, inflation's a little too high still, right? Maybe we didn't do X, Y, Z and shift it on. But if you continue to elect folks who support President Trump, this is the outcome that you're gonna get. So um, let's, let's kind of dig into the issues here because I mean, broadly, broadly speaking, this is really an argument between you know, Republicans who want this election to be about high inflation, immigration, crime, border security, and Democrats who want the election to be about what you're talking about. They want it to be about preserving democracy. They want it to be about abortion rights, uh, among other things. So let's start with the Republican side, uh, David, and let's, let's start with immigration because it's been such a flashpoint lately uh, with what Ron DeSantis has done, sending immigrants uh, to states here in the Northeast. Uh, what do you view as the you know, motivating forces behind what he's done, and how do you think it's gonna impact the campaign? Well, listen, I think we ha when you think about immigration, I think you have to think about it in two different ways. There is clearly a huge immigration problem 
in the country and on the southern border. I mean, the statistics from Customs and Border Protection just this week indicated that there have been more than two million mm -hmm. encounters yeah. at the border. That's a record setting yep. number. So there's clearly a problem that Washington has, I don't want to say largely ignored, failed to be able to find consensus to actually come up with solutions, right? right. So For decades. For decades. So, <laughs> so, I mean, since Ronald Reagan was president, basically, was the last time we saw... Well, real... I mean, George Bush tried when I was a student here. Exactly. Years ago. Yeah. And we saw it in the Obama years. Uh, it, was, it was tried and failed. So there, that's only been a growing problem that Washington has not successfully addressed yet. That is true, right? That, that exists. The other pocket of immigration that you have to look at is the pure political play, which is what I, I think you see Ron DeSantis doing here, understanding that it is an issue that motivates the Republican base much more so than it does the Democratic base. Uh, and it is an issue that can drive up that enthusiasm inside that base. And so d doing something that is, you know, basically a political stunt, like what he's doing of, uh, flying uh, folks to Martha's Vineyard to make a point, you, there's no way around that but that that is politics. pure politics and for political consumption and for political programming, especially on the right. And then I would just note, the third piece of this is, of course, when you're doing that, there's a human component to what's going on that is a story that gets covered as well, um, and, and rightfully so, about what's actually happening when you decide to make a political play with human, real human beings uh, yeah. who are uh, having to be a part of it. But I think that human being component is something that the White House is trying to use to their advantage. Um, when you talk to officials in the building, they say that they feel that Republicans miscalculated and um, went too far in a lot of different ways, and therefore they're going to be aggressive in the way that they address it. So from the podium, you saw White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre repeatedly call it a political stunt, repeatedly make it... Um, uh, use really fierce language, some language that we don't necessarily hear from her every day from that podium, when she's talking about the ways that they feel that uh, Republicans, DeSantis, Abbott, have gone too far, have um, used these people in ways that they shouldn't be used, really, for, as a political stunt. Um, and so I think that the White House for that issue, immigration is not something that they really want to talk about. It is a good week for them if they're not taking multiple questions on it. And so I think you're seeing them really play in the margins in terms of when it comes to that cultural aspect. Look, midterm elections are about motivation. Yeah. They're about motivating your base to come out. And DeSantis uh, did a pretty good job of motivating Republicans. I was talking to a Republican today in New Hampshire who said, this is great, you know, and this, this is great for us because it motivates people to say, wait a minute, there's a problem at the border. Why aren't you guys in the media talking about the problem at the border? And he did that. But, but Joe Biden is saying they're inhumane. Look at how inhumane the Republicans are. And what I think the Republicans saw was that on abortion, the Democrats were motivating their base. And immigration is something that motivates Republicans. Crime. We're going to be hearing an awful lot more about crime in a lot of different parts of the country because that also motivates the Republican base. It's all about, I mean, it's a cliche, but midterm elections especially are about turnout. And so what you're seeing is people trying, uh, both parties, trying to figure out a way to get their people to the polls. Yeah. Well, I think for, you know, for, for all of you who are, you know, starting to really learn about, you know, kind of how these systems work and, and observe elections, you know, in your adult lives and participate in them uh, sometimes for the first time. I mean, one of the big differences, I think, for us as we all cover midterm elections versus presidential elections, independent voters are always a very important part of that calculus. They do play a role in midterm elections. But you can see from the way politicians act that they are typically less important in midterm elections, that base turnout is what's right. most important. It helps explain, like, why Joe Biden gave the speech that he gave, which, you know, frankly, was polarizing potentially for independent re voters, Republican-leaning people who would be willing to vote for him, but is very energizing for Democrats. And part of the reason why uh, Democratic candidates may be more willing to have him on the trail is because most of his approval rating increases actually among Democrats. It's Democrats who are starting to say, oh, I was disappointed with the president, but now I like him. Uh, and that bodes well for trying to get people out to the polls, which is really the battle in the midterm elections. And it's, like, it's why you hear us kind of spending so much time um, focused on it. And I mean, David, do you think to the extent that, you know, what we've seen from DeSantis and others, and, and you could wrap crime into this, I mean, I was looking at 
you know, there's ads against Fetterman, for example, in Pennsylvania, who many of our students who are very online are probably the most familiar with him over many of the other uh, Senate candidates out there. I mean, Oz is trying to really make some hay on his previous positions on, you know, pardoning criminals and other things. How much success do you think Republicans are having? Well, um, there is no doubt that uh, there is some traction on that issue. When you, you know, when you look at polling, as much as you can believe in polling these days, but <laughs> like when you uh, look at polling, uh, that is an issue when crime is front and center like that, that tends to favor Republicans. When voters are asked, which party do you trust more to deal with this issue? Um, immigration, border security, that uh, has a crime component uh, to it in some of the messaging, but also just like straight up like street crime that, uh, or an increase in violent crime in, uh, in certain communities is also a key component of the Republican messaging. In fact, I think in the last month, crime has become the number one messaging issue for Republicans with advertising dollars. So if you just look at where the campaigns, the candidates, the parties are putting their money, like what message they are funding the most, in the last month for Republicans, it actually has been crime, and for Democrats, far and away, it's uh, abortion rights, which is also just, uh, shows you the power of that Supreme Court decision flipping on its head. I mean, Democrats, we would cover for <laughs> years and years races Democrats never wanted to talk about abortion. In fact, it was an issue that riled up, now you know, Republicans the fight don't want to. <laughs> uh, for uh, overturning Roe was an issue that riled up and got uh, right-wing conservatives uh, enthused and engaged. And, you know, now it's sort of like the dog that caught the car. After a 50-year quest, uh, the court overturns that. And now it's the Democrats who are able to utilize that issue as a motivating factor. So I do think uh, crime is something we have seen works. I think what we saw in 2020, Casey, if you recall, Republicans made greater inroads in the House, they didn't win the majority, obviously, than many of them expected, I, you know, never mind observers, just the Republican candidates themselves, yeah. running on this defund the police attack, that like, you know, labeling uh, Democrats as the party for defund the police. It's why you see President Biden at a State of the Union address telling the country, I want to fund the police, because he understood how politically damaging that brand of defund the police was for Democrats. And Republicans saw that. They, they believe they won greater numbers in the House two years ago on that alone. Yeah. And I believe, by the way, the DCCC chairman, the, the Sean Patrick Maloney, who's charged with winning and now keeping the House majority for Democrats, I believe in his post-2020 analysis, he also cited that as a yeah. huge uh, problem for Democrats in 2020. So that's where you, I don't think it takes, like you can see in the numbers where that messaging has worked for Right, Republicans. yeah, no, and I think it, it can also explain, for those of you that are paying attention to what Congress is doing right now, Democrats are trying to pass a law enforcement funding bill as we speak because many right. of these uh, Democrats who are trying to hold on to their vulnerable seats really want them to do that. So um, let's switch, let's sort of expand out here because um, I, I do want to get into an in-depth conversation about abortion because I know uh, it's something that really, uh, that everyone is very, very interested in. But, but let's also talk about the economy because this is really sort of fought over territory, right? This is something Republicans, Gloria, thought, you know, they were going to be able to run on the whole entire summer. Gas prices did drop, handed the White House, you know, a pretty big gift. Uh, but at the same time, we just saw the Federal Reserve today raise interest rates by, you know, uh, three quarters of a percent of a point. Um, they clearly think inflation is still a problem. How does this uh, potentially continue through the campaign? What, what impact do you see it having? I think the economy is so important when you look at the polls. People still say the economy is number one. You know, there's no, you're not going to dethrone the economy. I was talking to somebody today who said people's heating bills are going to go up, even if their gas bills may be going down. They see what's going on in the supermarket. You know, this is where we live. This is important to people. Uh, you go shopping and you see that, the, you know, that everything is, everything is going up. So I think it's a problem, particularly when the White House, as much as they try to message on this, the president will say, well, the rate of inflation going up is so small, it's kind of plateaued, and isn't that good news? It's been flat for six months. Right, right. exactly. And that people hear that, and they go, you don't understand me. You don't see my grocery bill. Yeah. And the one thing about Joe Biden is he always tells his staff, 
You have to be able to explain this policy to your grandmother, and I want you to be able to do that. Well, they're not really succeeding at doing that because people feel it. So it is yeah. still the number one issue. Think of it as kind of the wallpaper, I think, that is, that is behind everything. And so they're trying to change the subject, and that abortion, as, as you guys were talking about, is so important. Women voters are registering in droves. You saw what happened uh, in Kansas. Um, so I think that um, that is so important. So the social issues and the cultural issues are really important. They're going to drive people out there. But in the end, whether they say, ha you know, the famous Ronald Reagan line, do I feel better today than I did four years ago, except now it's two years ago. <laughs> and people may forget that there was a pandemic, and therefore, of course, the economy tanked, and we're coming back, and et cetera, et cetera. You can make that argument, but when you talk to people at home, how do you feel? They're going to say, I don't feel better than I felt two years ago. And that's hurting Joe Biden, and I don't think there's any way to get around it. Yeah, it's really Yeah, I mean, there's no, if you think about the way that this White House can impact the economy, they've basically done what they can do, right? They have released oil through their strategic reserve. They have passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which, you know, will take time, but they say that that is going to bring down some of these high numbers that we see, right? Really, that policy comes from the Federal Reserve and the White House, and Joe Biden says that those are two separate entities, and so they have to let them work. So what they can do is message that we understand. We understand that you are paying more when you go to the grocery store, but look at your gas prices. We understand that it takes more money and time to get from A to B, but think about student loans, right? They can do things within the margin to make people feel somewhat better about the economy, but there's not a lot policy-wise that they can do, especially when you're talking about how much time they have left between the midterms. What is it, 49, 50 days? So it's like, other than maybe some permitting action on the Hill or, or the, the House on policing, on the policing bill from the House, there's not so much that they can do, which means that they turn to messaging. And they're turning to how can we make our base feel excited? And that excitement comes from student loans, right? That excitement, how do we bring young people out? forgiving $10,000 in student loans, doing something that Biden said that he would do two years ago. How do we turn people out? Making sure that they understand that, that we know that they want a choice between their body autonomy. So those are the kinds of things that when we're talking about shifting the messaging that we see from the White House, because President Biden knows as a man who is, says that he's a blue collar president, he knows what it's like to have uh, uh, your paycheck look shorter Right, He knows what it's like to see those credit card bills, at least his family does, knows what it's like to see those credit card bills expand. So I think that it's now the game of shifting that messaging and seeing how we can pull people from their homes to that ballot box, to that ballot. Yeah, I mean, it's the reality is this is a, to shift to messaging on the economy, it's a very tough political message to fight Republicans and say, no, things are not that bad, while simultaneously trying to empathize with people who are having a really hard time. So the answer, bottom line, is change the subject. Um, so speaking of subjects, um, let's let's switch gears a little bit because you know abortion has been such an animating conversation. And David, when this first when this decision first came down, I've certainly heard from a lot of Republican sources who basically tried to dismiss it. They're like, this is not going to help Democrats very much. This is not going to be a big deal. Um, and as I think you used the phrase, the dog who caught the car, I had, you know, one Republican um, member of Congress who says he used to warn his colleagues like, you're shooting blanks right now when you're talking about uh, blank bullets when you're talking about um, when you're talking about making changes to abortion laws, but now you're firing with five rounds. Now that the, it's actually switched, um, and that what happens is very politically dangerous. Yeah. So I'll go back a few months before the decision. You know, as far back as February, I was talking to some uh, Democratic officials, White House officials, campaign strategists, uh, all of whom were already anticipating this decision, right, was uh, going to go this way even before the leaked opinion came out, and already sort of circling it as, we are facing an election that has so many headwinds, the party in power, what happens in a first, uh, in a president's first term, midterms historically, with the economy and the inflation, and everything that was going on. They knew they had a lot of headwinds, and to a person, they were like, but when the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, 
we're going to be in a different universe. A lot of Democratic strategists really believed it had the potential to change the calculus. Um, and yes, I talked to Republicans too who downplayed it, but honest Republicans, I think, like they're realized most honest, realized thing. that it yeah. was going to be uh, something that they were going to contend with. To Gloria's point, though, we should just be careful here as we're going to do this deep dive into abortion rights now. It is not clear that it is going to be sufficient to withstand all the things Gloria said about the economy and historically what happens. We, we don't know that. What we know is at this moment in time, there is no doubt that the court decision and the political fallout from it has shifted the political landscape. I think every Republican and Democrat on a ballot would concede that in this moment. It shifted from what it was, which looked like it was going to be a massive red wave wipeout of a year. Now, add gas prices coming down, Donald Trump becoming more front and center, there are other factors as well, but nothing like the Dobbs decision that ignited the Democratic base into a moment of action in this season. It just shifted the, the terrain beneath uh, all these politicians. And again, I just think we should be careful as we think through this because whether or not that is actually sufficient to overcome all these other factors, I don't think we know that yet. And I, I, I just would be wary about that. What we do know is that um, women are registering to vote. And we saw that in Kansas before there was uh, the question of a referendum on whether abortion should be banned in the, in the state of Kansas. There were, uh, there were statistics, and I don't know how accurate they were, you know, that showed that 70% of the new registrants in, um, in Kansas were Democratic women. I don't, I can't verify that, to be honest. Um, and then there, there are data that show that in some places, Women, suburban women, are registering to vote, and Democrats are kind of hanging their hat on that, saying, well, maybe that will change the balance. Um, we don't know, I, I don't think we know. I just don't think we know whether it's gonna be enough, and if, you know, you talk to Democratic pollsters, um, they will, they're very excited, but they're also nervous about it, because they don't know, they don't know either, and they don't wanna get over excited about it because of these headwinds that, that we've all been talking about. But Casey, when you talk about live rounds, like now, like after, and again, I, I don't know how to convey, I guess I've been covering politics a long time now and there's been one constant through a couple decades of covering <laughs> politics, which has been the energy of the pro-life movement, yeah. okay? That, it, every political rally I've ever covered, Democrat or Republican, and it therefore, uh, the pro-life folks were either protesting that person or supporting that person, but they were the guaranteed, um, I don't want to say interest group, but sort of issue-oriented voters showing up. They showed up it, like, every election, every, every event. Where? All every, the time. Like, it, was, it, it was the constant. Other issues would come and go, other activists would show up at these events, but, and I'm sure you saw this when you were on the campaign trail as well, yes. guaranteed were the pro, were pro-life voters who but and you so guys I, see it walking around campus people with posters i mean it's it's the most common it's the most common thing and so to have a 50-year quest and motivation and to reach the promised land obviously a hugely successful moment for that movement but as republican politicians always said well it's now going to go back to the states so the moment it happens it creates all these questions yeah. for candidates back in the states yeah. about what their state laws are gonna be dealing with uh, this issue, and, and that has created um, sort of political quicksand. And I think just to put a fine point on that, you, you have to think about how the issue of abortion is gonna play in different states, right? Take New Hampshire and Georgia, two very important Senate uh, races, and obviously Maggie Hassan is having some trouble time. Um, she's neck and neck with her opponent, but some Democrats feel like abortion is going to be the thing. If she holds on that seat, that is what got her over the line. That is what got suburban women out. But then you take a look at Georgia and you take a look at that vote. In 2020, obviously they flipped for Joe Biden. It came down to black voters. It came down to Asian voters, but neither of those groups are monolithic. And specifically when you talk about black voters, there is a certain sect of a black voter that actually goes to the polls that is not pro-choice. 
you can't just automatically assume that black voters are going to be in favor of abortion. So the issue of abortion plays so differently when it comes to different sectors of the country because of those constituents. So it's not necessarily going to be something that, um, you know, obviously we don't know how it's going to turn out, but I think that if you're Reverend Warnock, who is very astute in the church, he's not going to necessarily be putting all of his eggs in the abortion basket, to say. Yeah, it's one of the reasons Stacey Abrams is so interesting, because she has not always been as, you know, a, a pro-abortion rights as she is being in this particular mm -hmm. uh, campaign, as she she works on can, turnout. Can I say one, add one other thing about yeah. another issue that interests me over the years? I mean, you talk about how important uh, abortion has been for the Republican Party, the pro-life movement has been so constant. Gun control, which was striving to get to that moment where you could depend on your voters to come out as Demo Democratic voters to say, look, we're pro-gun control. Some in the Democratic Party were very hopeful that Uvalde, for example, would be a motivating moment for Democratic voters to come out and say, okay, finally. And Joe Biden has done something on gun control. Yep. However small it was, it's passed still- Passed a bipartisan it, bill. Exactly, still passed a bipartisan Missing bill. Missing a lot of- And for some reason, on. and it's so interesting, for some reason, the issue of guns, um, which is personal to everyone, not as personal as a woman's right, um, it's to choose, et cetera, but that never reached the level of uh, interest and motivation and that, um, that abortion has, or, or the constancy that abortion it's has, even after Newtown, even after Uvalde. Yeah. No, what we see in polling around guns is interest and motivation surge right. around one of those horrific events that like dominate our consciousness and, and you know, Every, th there's a huge surge of interest and motivation, and when that begins to fade, and this is what activists say all the time, and they're so concerned yeah. about as they're trying to argue for this, when that fades from the headlines, so too does the polling follow yeah. that, and it just becomes an issue with less salience for voters. Well, and I think just or to, to no, no, you're fine to bring it to bring it back to you know, uh, abortion, I think this is gonna be a big question for Democratic activists who care about this issue, is mm -hmm. how are they going to continue the momentum around this? Yeah. Because, you know, it, it is very hard to sustain interest, focus, to raise money around a particular, you know, pick your political issue and keep the spotlight trained on it. I mean, gun mm -hmm. control is a very, very good example of this. And the pro-life movement really did a, a, a really striking job of doing it on the issue that they really cared the most about. And I think it's gonna be interesting to see if this is something that, you know, A, has an impact in the election that we're talking about and the way that David is, is talking about, but B, whether they can cons continue uh, that as they continue to fight for what they want politically. And, you know, David, I, I was struck by you were talking about talking to people in February. One of the things that I think is most salient for people about this abortion debate right now is that the Supreme Court took quite literally the most extreme available route to this, right? So John Roberts, who has, you know, developed something of a reputation as kind of the center, center weight of the court, you know, tried, we've learned from these leaks, to find some sort of, maybe not middle ground if you're an abortion rights supporter, but something that put some, protected some element of that right to 15 weeks of pregnancy with potentially with exceptions. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the current, what did happen would have been John Roberts' ultimate goal, but what he really was trying to do was sort of like elongate the path there right. and try to bring the country along. Ease, uh, in ease a way. Right. it in. Yeah. So, I mean, so that, but I, but I think what, what happened was, you know, now you have states where, you know, their policies are just way far off where Americans are in terms of what they think uh, abortion policy should be. They are, you know, either complete bans, very draconian at six weeks, they don't include exceptions for rape and incest in the life of the mother. And I'm just curious, David, I, my sense is that's part of what is so animating and why it is that this is such a strong issue in the midterms. No, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Had the Supreme Court come to, again, maybe not a middle ground, but like, had, first of all, had they just dealt with the Mississippi factor right. and not dealt with Roe at all, right? right? That probably would not have been as motivating of a moment because Absolutely. it would not have been that, the culmination of that 50 year battle, right? Um, but as you're saying, if there were 
some, we, we can see in the polling, some restrictions on abortion are politically popular, um, and you, but it, there's, a, there's a continuum. And the court in Dobbs just went all the way to one end of the continuum and ignited uh, this potential uh, opportunity for Democrats, clearly some backlash out in, in, in the country around this. I, I just want to, you brought up Kansas, Corey, and I just want to mention one other thing. Because as Casey was saying, it's unclear, you know, can you keep this going as an issue all the way through this election and beyond? But what Kansas, that Gloria cited the stats about the registration in Kansas, their abortion was literally on the ballot, right? It was not just an issue being brought up by candidates. And so look for where abortion rights are going to be an actual issue on the ballot, like in a referendum where voters are voting. Um, one of the key battleground states in American politics is going to have that on the ballot in Michigan. And that, uh, we may see a totally different kind of electorate in turnout the way we saw in Kansas in Michigan this year because this issue is literally on its own on the ballot, not just rhetorical. It's not being carried by you know, a candidate that has a whole slate of other issues or potential problems or you know, is affecting people because they have a D or an R by their name. It's just asking people right. yes or no on this particular issue. It's a much different scenario. Well, and it's been my experience. When you try and take something away from people, they don't like it. <laughs> and this is taking something away from women that has been the law for 50 years. Like, this, this isn't just saying, okay, you know, we're changing your tax law. Maybe you can deduct this this year, but you couldn't deduct it uh, before. This is something that's been there for 50 years. And it's very, very easy. And, to and this is the reason, I believe, that Republicans have such difficulty figuring out a way to take away Obamacare. Because people had Obamacare. And, and they really didn't, it was imperfect and everything else. But they couldn't figure out a way to take it away that wouldn't be unpopular. So, you know, it's kind of uh, politics 101. People like something. Women sort of came to accept it as part of their lives. Through the last Utilize year. it, you know, like. Yeah. And so I think that that's a message that the White House is trying to drive home. You see the Vice President, Kamala Harris, basically at every opportunity, she's going three times a week to different states to talk to their legislators to try to say, okay, how do we form a national message on abortion that can carry us from September now to November. And it's that idea of that you don't have to, this is something that she says, and I listen to it a lot, so I can almost <laughs> recite it by word. She says yeah. that you don't have to be pro-choice, right? That's her message. You don't have to be pro-choice, but you do have to kind of believe that women should be allowed to choose whatever they want to do. You don't have to be pro-abortion. And so I think that that is going to be that kind of national message that Democrats who know that some of the people coming to the ballot may not be gung-ho about abortion. May, they may have religious um, uh, feelings about it. They may just not want that to happen. But they are still understanding that women should be able to do with what they want with their body. And so I think that when you br the, what the White House is trying to do when you talk to aides inside the White House, they're trying to break it down to the most simple language, that it is not necessarily about this very political thing. It's about a woman having the freedom to do what she wants with what she will. And I think that that basic message is how Democrats feel like they can reach beyond just those very energized woman voters. They can get to male voters. They can get to folks who traditionally are very, very religious who necessarily wouldn't want to vote in favor of abortion. By the way, you all don't know this perhaps, but Jasmine is the national expert on all things Kamala Harris. <laughs> <laughs> She's been covering Kamala Harris nonstop for CNN for four years Can now. Can you recite so, some of her? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if any of you Hope ever end up yeah. covering or, or working on a political campaign right. and you go to these rallies, I mean, I can still recite like Mitt Romney's from 2012 by heart. <laughs>
<laughs> so That's I'm true. sure Kamala right. is going to be like that it's, for your whole yeah. life. <laughs> I see her with my eyes open. <laughs> Um, in your dreams. In my dreams. <laughs> so before we turn to take some of our, we've got a ton of questions uh, from our audience, so thank you guys so much for, for all the interest. But uh, we do need to talk about uh, the elephant in the room, and uh, that is Donald Trump. Um, because obviously, you know, we've talked a lot about, is this a referendum on the president? Is this, what is this election? The White House and Democrats clearly would love for this to be a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump again. Because if you'll remember, uh, Joe Biden did, in fact, win. Donald Trump did lose um, to Joe Biden. Uh, David, what, what role do you think the president's sort of very tr public travails are having uh, on the midterms here in the final stretch? Um, you know, the Donald Trump factor, uh, and it is one uh, in American politics and in this uh, election season, it's always a bit, you know, it's a two-sided coin. Donald Trump has a proven ability, at least when he is on the ballot. We will see what his proven ability is uh, not being on the ballot. But he has a proven ability to drive up turnout um, among his core base of support to record-setting numbers. By the way, you know, like we saw in 2020 when he lost that election to Joe Biden, he had increased his vote share and, and turned out voters uh, that had not voted before. That, and he has this... Um, I would call it perhaps the strongest connection to a base of voters that I've ever seen a politician have in my entire time covering politics. And so there's that side where him being out there has the potential to do that. The flip side of the coin is, of course, it also has the potential to repel the independent and swing voters in these battleground districts and battleground states that are critical to Republican successes in winning the majorities in, in the House and the Senate. Uh, that you know revolted away from Trump in 2020 and delivered the White House to Joe Biden. That in 2018 delivered the Democratic majorities uh, that you see today uh, in uh, in the House. So I I do think that um, he he does have both of that. There is there is some evidence to suggest that there has been some diminishment of support even among Republicans. Uh, with everything that Donald Trump is facing day in and day out. Though, I think that there's a lot of um, overwriting and overanalyzing about that diminishment of support because I think it is, uh, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that it's anything but rather small at the moment. He is the clear um, energy inside the Republican Party. He is the clear sort of um, North Star for the Republican primary electorates that we saw throughout this uh, primary season in most places. So I, um, you know, I think that Republicans who are trying to win the majorities are not eager, like Mitch McConnell, to like <laughs> have Donald Trump front and center. They don't. They think it gets them off the message of the economy, inflation, immigration, crime, immigration. Crime. Even if their messages that Donald Trump would talk about. But Donald Trump talks about Donald Trump, and he talks about his grievances. And the Republican establishment trying to win these majorities knows that, so they don't see him as particularly helpful if he is front and center. And clearly the Democrats do see him as particularly helpful to their efforts if he is front and center. That's why Joe Biden gave that speech in Philadelphia. So um, I do think he will be a factor. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know that that calculus that I just described, Casey, is somehow going to prevent the Republicans from being able to win majorities, if you know, on something like the economy. It, it, he'll be a factor. I don't think he'll be the defining factor. Right. I think what's interesting to me about Biden, I mean, uh, about Trump, is that for the longest time, all he talked about was how he won, you know, the 2020 election, and there were a lot of Republicans. He's still talking about it, <laughs> um, and there are a lot of Republicans who are getting sick of that and saying we have to look to the future. We can't look to the past. Now he's got something else about himself to talk about, which is the search at Mar-a-Lago. And in that, he has made himself the victim, uh, which he does very well, and the FBI is the bad guy, and you know, big government is the bad guy. And you saw what happened after that search. He rallied the troops tremendously. He raised an awful lot of money off of it. And he's still going to be talking about it because, of course, now these legal cases, and we have the January 6th hearing coming back next week, 
and wrapping up, but these legal cases are going to continue and continue. So he has another way to present himself as a victim, which is not only the fact that he won the election, as he says, in 2020, but now they're out to get him. And this is something that very much appeals to his base, and Republicans have twisted themselves in knots over what really happened at Mar-a-Lago. Should he have had those documents? Um, and it's a problem for them, and it may be keeping Donald Trump from announcing for the presidency as quickly as we thought he was going to do, because he can use the money from his PAC to pay his legal fees. Um, but it's another, it's another twist. In the, in the Donald Trump story and how that's going to affect everything. So this is a great segue into a, a couple of, of great questions we got that are on this, this topic. I was talking to a, a Republican candidate um, who uh, recently, who actually had worked for Donald Trump, but ended up being the sort of more mainstream of the candidates in this particular race. And this person pointed out to me that these were the kinds of things he was meeting voters on the trail mm -hmm. uh, day in and day out who were absolutely convinced of the things that Donald Trump was saying about the election in particular, um, that it was stolen from uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and you know, this is somebody who had been around politics a long time, who really understood you know, kind of like how these things are and um, was just flabbergasted by the way that this information had kind of come out into the electorate and was just absolutely impossible to dislodge. And so one of the questions that we have here um, and David, I'll, I'll start with you here. Um, what do you make of candidates who are changing their stances on Stop the Steal? Because uh, one of the, the, the last, most recent race we had was New Hampshire, right, where Don Baldwick, who uh, became the Republican nominee, came out the next day and immediately changed his position on this, but needed to message to those voters, apparently, in the primary to win over someone who you know, refused, uh, or at least wouldn't go as far as he did, uh, to say that the election was stolen. Yeah, I mean, Bulldog is the most uh, it's extreme a example <laughs> yet uh, that exists. And I think one reason why is that he didn't have Donald Trump's endorsement. So while he definitely courted the Trump base and leaned into his support of the election denialism uh, and no doubt wanted Donald Trump's endorsement, that, that is uh, clear, Trump didn't play in that race. And... What that allowed, some that allowed Baldock to do this complete. Now it may not work for him. I'm not suggesting it, but to do this just complete 180 and be like, no, now I'm in a general election and I'm not going <laughs> to run on that because he could do it yeah. without the fear <laughs> that he was going to be bedeviled by two weeks of headlines of Donald Trump now pulling his endorsement because he no longer supports his lie about the election, as we saw play out in some other. Uh, races like in the right. Alabama Senate race this year or what have you. So that actually freed him up to do that. Again, I'm not suggesting that the general election voters in New Hampshire are going to buy that flip. I'm just saying yeah. the count. That wasn't a pivot. <laughs> that was a, no, it was, a, it was, was a, a straight up change. Yeah. So we had another question along these lines. Um, someone asks, how will these Republicans influence uh, turnout? But I'm particularly interested in the second half of the question was, how do you think that co th these candidates will react, and I'm thinking of Carrie Lake in Arizona, how will they react if they lose? <laughs> well, I think you've seen it already. <laughs> uh, I think that they, there is a good chance, at least we don't know what anyone's gonna do, but I think that there's a good chance that they will follow the playbook that the former president laid out himself, saying that something was wrong, this was you know, falsely claiming that there were errors, that there was Michigas about, you know, that there was, as Joe Biden may put it, malarkey happening. And um, I think that there has been enough that was done after the 2020 election that there is a pathway. And I think also another part of this midterm is going to be about who are the state officials that are being put into these states that have to eventually certify the results on the state level, not just in the in Congress. And so I think that there is kind of a whole machine afoot about how these elections are going to go if, if somebody loses. Well, they're not going to be decided overnight. People are going to challenge elections right and left. You have election deniers uh, running for office, huge numbers. And um, so I think the sort of old days of when you had a campaign and it was done, the next day you knew who the, what the result was. When there was a tight race, 
in Pennsylvania, Donald Trump told Oz, Dr. Oz, just declare you won. Now, he ended up winning, and, but remember what Trump said to him, just say you won. Remember what happened after this election. Donald Trump came out at what, two or three in the morning? You all remember, we were all up saying, I won, I won. So I think we're gonna actually see a lot of that. And I think a lot of the election machinery is changing, as you were saying, um, and that, that would support that. So uh, everyone has to be very careful. Everyone has to understand every vote counts. Everyone has to preserve democracy. And hopefully there will be so many eyes on every election that um, we won't have massive problems, but you can't predict that that won't happen. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, one of the, the lessons of 2020 is that there were a lot of unsung heroes, yep. uh, Republicans in some of these critical states. I'm thinking of you know, Rusty Bowers in Arizona, Maybe. Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. I mean, who would have thought that these people would become household names for many of us, but they are really the only thing that stood in between uh, the actual result of the election being protected and a very concerted effort from Donald Trump. I mean, we have heard the calls he made to Brad Raffensperger to attempt to change his mind, and there are a lot of people who might have folded under uh, pressure like that. So we've got a couple critical races like that on the ballot uh, coming up to keep an eye on. Um, let's switch gears, because we haven't really dug into this. Uh, Jasmine, you mentioned um, student loan forgiveness, which uh, we have a couple questions uh, about that, which I'm sure you know many people in this room are, are dealing with potentially having to confront uh, that over over the coming years. Um, we have one that says, do you believe the issue of student debt forgiveness will present itself uh, as a prevalent topic among youth voters and how do you think people, Democratic Congress people will respond? I mean, I think it's hard to tell. I think it's too early. Um, I think that that's one of the reasons why we have exit polls, right? To see who is voting for what reason. I do think that it is something that when I talk to, not just young people, but specifically young people, when I talk to my family members, they ask me, number one, or number two, when is Joe Biden gonna forgive student loans? Uh, how much is he gonna forgive? And so I think that this is something that when you talk to officials before the decision came out, they knew that he had to come out and say whether or not he was gonna do it. Um, and now that the decision is out, they feel that it is something that he lived up to what he said he was gonna do. Um, he never said more than 10,000, even though, of course, like the NAACP, Chuck Schumer, you name it, we're trying to make him go 50,000. Of course, we have the 20,000 for Pell Grants. So I think that it is something that the White House feels as though they have given to folks who have massive debt. And though it may, it may not eclipse their debt, it will, provide some relief, and that is the relief that Joe Biden was comfortable with. And um, I think that they feel like that is just gonna be another data point to show this is how the president took care of you. There are lots of moderate Democrats who hated it and have used it as a way to say, I don't agree with Joe Biden on everything because it is unpopular in certain places uh, among people who say, look, I paid my, I paid my loans back, why are you, why are you giving somebody else you know, money when I scrimped and saved and I paid my loans back and the people who are gonna get this $10,000 don't really need the money? So it was very controversial. And some Democrats liked it and, and some moderates running for office are using it as a way to say, look, I don't agree with Joe Biden on everything. And the White, but the White House knew that. They knew that nobody yep. would be fully happy with their decision. One, because it was $10,000. A lot of people wanted more. The second part is because some people did not think that he should do it. It shouldn't be the government's role to forgive the student loans. It's not fair, it's not equitable. But he made that choice and the White House made that choice because they felt like this was something that he could easily follow through on and there were a lot of advocates, including the vice president, that wanted him to go forward with it. But he struggled with it. It, yeah. it took him a lot of time and it's because Joe Biden was in a position that he doesn't like to be in, which is that he took a position that he knew was gonna be very politically popular with the base of his party, and he didn't wanna have to confront his own base of his party in, in, in this, yet he understood 
that it really divided the country pretty equally, that it was not necessarily an overall winning political position to be in, which Joe Biden doesn't like that calculus. He doesn't like to just play, as Gloria said, he wants to explain stuff that everybody's grandmother can understand and get behind. Like, he doesn't love being in a position of like, I know it's gonna make these friends of mine happy, and I don't want to invite a problem here inside my family, but I also know that it is going to be a divisive issue broadly for the American people, which the polling shows that it is. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I've learned over the years of, of covering politics, and, you know, I come from a, I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs. Uh, we weren't wealthy, but we never wanted for anything. Everybody that I knew went to college. You know, I'm sure many of you are in that position. We may have some people who are the first person in their family to go to college in this room tonight. I'm, I'm not sure. But either way, everybody sitting here is in a very privileged position because the reality is that most Americans don't have a college degree. Uh, and so when you try to understand some of the dynamics underlying a lot of these issues, you know, when you're coming from one perspective, it seems obvious to you, but it's not necessarily uh, as obvious to everyone. Um, so I think that's you know, just something to keep in mind as you're all kind of progressing on, on your journeys, whether you end up working uh, in politics, in media, or, or, or anywhere else. Um, well, let's talk for a second about the Inflation Reduction Act because we actually got several questions about that. Like, oh. does it actually reduce inflation? <laughs> How about I that? Know they, I know they call it. <laughs> when will inflation be reduced? <laughs> Today, <laughs> tomorrow? Yeah. Um, this one's actually about climate change because okay. the bill actually does include a bunch of measures related uh, to that. Um, but this, our, our questioner, um, who unfortunately is nameless, um, but it asks, with previous initiatives, we've seen that they just haven't been enforced or they haven't been enforced appropriately. Do you think it's going to be different this time? Who knows? I mean, who knows? Joe Biden's going around the, the country saying, look, we're, we're doing this for electric cars, we're putting in, we're you know, electric stations, stations. we're doing, country. so we don't, we, you know, we don't know who's going to control the Congress next time. So we don't know what is done that could be undone. But again, in this terms of undoing things, there are lots of Republicans who believe in climate change. So I think that, you know, there is a, you know, there, who knows? You know, the answer to that is, who knows? They ought to be bragging about it, just like they ought to be bragging in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is just terribly named. They ought to be bragging about bringing down your prescription drug costs eventually by, in what, 2025, 20, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so they ought to be talking about that stuff, and they're not, and they... Yeah. One, one of the lessons of what Gloria is saying is that if they name a bill something, you it's should like, always be skeptical about whether or not it actually <laughs> right. they can't, I, what it claims. And when, it, <laughs> and when inflation is so high, it's just like, and this is not, not yeah. a good look. This is yeah. a both parties problem. <laughs> it's not just an Inflation Reduction Act problem. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, David, here's uh, another question. Um, gas prices, mm -hmm. if they go up again, how bad is that for Democrats? Um, not good. I don't like. I don't, I don't know any Democrat that, or I don't know any Republican that wants to see gas prices go up either. But politically, uh, you don't want to be the party in charge of everything while people are feeling pain at the pump. Now, the White House touted for 99 days in a row that the gas prices uh, went down, and uh, we'll see if they do indeed uh, go back up now in a significant way. But here is the reality. That's down from some absurdly high place. I don't know how many of you have cars here or you're all sort of uh, public transportation dependent at the moment or walking Ubers. around. But, but Ubers uh, are high because gas is high. Well, so but it, from <laughs> such a ridiculously high place in June, uh, 99 days now, down obviously is a story you want to sell if you're in charge. The reality is people are still paying more for gas than they were a year ago right now. So uh, that uh, is never a good place that you want to be if you're the party in charge and you're about to go to the voters and ask them to re-up your contract. And what do you do? Do you say, okay, there's a war in Ukraine and the Russians have done this and this is terrible and this is why this is I mean, is that's happening. probably what they'll say. That's what they've said in the past. It's hard, though. <laughs> it's hard because a it's lot of people say, sorry, not my problem. Like, <laughs> my right. gas prices are up and I can't afford it. So it's, it's just not a good place to be yeah. no matter how hard you're trying to bring them down. Yeah. So we're, we're nearing the end of our, our time here together tonight, but um, I would wanted to end on, on this question uh, because I remember being in your shoes and wanting to know the answer. Um, 
What advice do you have for young people looking to have a career in journalism or politics and anything you would have done differently? And Jasmine, let me start with you because uh, you are at least at the beginning of your political journalism career as an embed and you have made, you have just done incredible uh, work in the time that you've been there. And what, what, what would you recommend to our friends here? Yeah, well, so I went to University of Illinois, um, Urbana-Champaign, Champaign-Urbana. I'm from Chicago. And I moved to DC to start working, so I'd already graduated college. And I think that if I were talking to myself out of, out of college, I would say go for everything. You can only hear, if you hear a no, that's not the worst case scenario, right? Um, when I was talking to David about becoming a political embed, I, I don't think he knows this, but I barely knew what a political embed was. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I did not know what it was, but he was so convincing, and I was nervous about being away from home. I was nervous about the, the work that, that would have to go into it. Everyone was like, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. But I decided to do it, and it was the greatest decision of my life because you get to do so much immersion into actually what politics looks like. So I think that a lot of times as young people, we feel like mm, maybe that's not right for me or I'm not ready for that right now or, or I shouldn't do that right now. I think that you should basically completely ignore that part of your brain and do whatever it is that you set out to do. Find whatever opportunities you can. Talk to people. If you're ever talking to somebody that works in politics, get their phone number. If you want to be a reporter or you want to be in politics, their phone, people don't change their phone numbers. They always have them. You can always <laughs> call them. It's true. And Mine's the same as it was when I was here. <laughs> it's always, it's, people don't change. It's too much of a hassle. So I just think you have to go for that opportunity, even if it's not exactly there, even if you have to kind of wiggle to get it, because you're never going to be disappointed if you do something that you didn't think you could do, and you do it well. And the one thing, you know, the job Jasmine had as a political embed, if journalism is what you want, and it's the School of Media and Public Affairs, that political embed job is, there is no job like it in the mm -hmm. industry. It is, uh, every network has them. Um, it is absolutely something that you should try to do. And the person who decides who's going to be the embed for CNN <laughs> is David Chalian. So David, what would you say to so our friends here? Send me all your resumes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I always tell folks, uh, when I get this question, I had such an unconventional path. And so one of the things I would suggest to folks is um, you will find that a lot of people, when you go and talk to them about a potential job, whether in politics or media, or whatever, well, where do you see yourself in five years? Or what is your, you, know, you don't need to know the answer to that. I just, like the, the journey is the thing and like you don't have to have it all mapped out from here to there and, and be okay with that because each experience is gonna inform you and, and uh, build who you are going forward. The one thing I always suggest to young people just starting out is it's a different slice of what Jasmine was saying, but say yes, say yes to everything. So when you get an opportunity and it maybe is not, you know, you think you're above it or it's a little too uh, small bore for you, um, but it is like a foot in the door to what can grow into potential. Say yes to that because th there's no, like, I find in these jobs, in both the news and from talking to sources in the political world who start out their careers there, like, there's no real small job. It's such a... Um, collaborative environment, everybody is sort of on a team and, and really trying to work towards the same goals. And being any part of that is a good place to be. And so I would just urge, I know we spend all this money on our education, we emerge and we you know, think that like we should be at a certain level. Or Just if you say yes to stuff and you are um, coming with your full self to that and saying, yes, I'm going to throw myself into this, I'm going to put my head down, I'm going to do this job being asked of me, that is going to be rewarded time and time again. Yeah, David's absolutely right. And one of the greatest things about being here at GW is that you are in the thick of it and you have all year to do it, not just the summer, which puts you at a huge advantage when you're competing with kids from, you know, Ivy League schools that we won't name. <laughs> Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to echo what David said in a little bit of a different way, which is don't look for the perfect job. There, 
starting out yes. and even now, <laughs> there is no perfect job. So let me just say to you, don't look for the perfect job. Look for what's out there and be excited about whatever it is that you can get. Because if you're excited, the people you work with will be excited too, and they will notice your excitement. I mean, I, I'm going to date myself now, but I'm going to tell you <coughs> what my first job was. Um, I started out when I was an intern at the Washington Star, which is a newspaper, remember those, that no longer exists <laughs> in Washington, D.C. I sat at a bank with Maureen Dowd, now a columnist Just at the say, New York Times. That's <laughs> how we became that's how we famous be, employees. That's what, how we became good friends is we used to take dictation um, from reporters in the field who were dictating stories to us on deadline for the afternoon newspaper. So they'd be talking to me and I'd be going, mm, and I don't know how to type, by the way. So I'd be like <laughs> making these ridicul uh, ridiculous mistakes. But I would be, and I, when I first got that job, I thought, and I was an intern, I thought, this is dumb. I know how to, I want to write a story. Well, I ended up writing stories. But I learned how to write them by listening to great reporters on deadline who were talking to me in my ear about breaking news. Mm -hmm. And so while I first thought, God, this is ridiculous. I'm not a secretary. I'm a reporter. Well, that led me to understand how to write a story. And so I said yes. And then I said yes to every other job that came along that maybe I thought, well, I'm better than this. Well, I wasn't better than that. And I learned. And I, and I wanted to do everything because I wanted to learn my business. And I wanted to learn my craft. And so my thing is, to play on what Nancy Reagan used to say, just say yes, OK? <laughs> just say yes to everything that comes along, and it won't be a bad decision. Yeah, no, it's, it's all very good advice. And you know, for my part, I would just say I, I, I kind of have it in my head as the three Ps. The first one is the phone. Pick up the phone. Yeah. Everybody now, you know, we're all inclined. I mean, and I'm guilty of it too. I send a text or I send an email instead of picking up the phone. Every single time I fail to pick up the phone, I regret it. And whenever I do, I learn more than I would have if I hadn't. And for a lot of you who are going to be going out into the world, the people that are going to be hiring you are still people who, you know, had Blackberries and Palm Pilots and <laughs> et cetera. You know, those connections that you make when you pick up the phone are so important. Which brings me to my second one, which is perseverance. When, when I was a student at GW, um, I was actually working for um, NBC News uh, uh, with a guy named Mark Murray, who is still there and who I worked with, you know, many years later. He was helping me get a job at National Journal Magazine. And the editor there interviewed me, it went really well, and he called me at the end and he said, I've got two candidates, you know, I really want to hire this guy who's an editor at the Harvard Crimson this summer, and you know, I don't know what he's going to say, but if he says no, you know, I, I'm happy to have you. It was a bummer, right? <laughs> I actually appreciated the honesty. <laughs> uh, but that's that was shocking. You know, that's why I saw a little yeah. chip on my shoulder about the Ivy League. Um, but, you know, so I said, okay, fine, you know, whatever. But, you know, so I just, every Friday, this was, you know, probably April, I needed to decide by May, and, you know, I wasn't in a position where I could take an unpaid internship. This, this job happened to pay, so I needed to know. I needed to know if I was going to do this or if I was going to go, you know, find a job waiting tables or something. Um, and every Friday in April, I called back, and every Friday, the editor said to me, you know, I'm so sorry, I still haven't heard from this guy from Harvard. Um, you know, I, I, I'll be back in touch if, if anything changes. I said, okay. Called again the next Friday, same thing. And then finally, at the end of the month, I was like, look, I got to make a decision here. I said to him, like, you know, do you, I, I really want this internship. I really want this job. It's really important to me. Um, and he said, you know what? I, I'm so sorry. I still haven't heard from the Harvard guy. I hung up. I said, all right, I guess that ship has sailed. Two minutes later, he picks up the phone and he calls me back. He's like, you know what? This Harvard guy clearly doesn't want this job as bad as you. And that matters more to me at the end. It's clear to me that you're going to do better at this, uh, so it's yours. And so that was how you know, I got my foot, my first you know, written, written bylines in a printed uh, publication was by doing that. Um, and so I would just recommend to you that if you are rejected, don't let it get you down. Um, don't let it stop you. Don't let it you know, get into your own head and make you judge yourself uh, because 
if you work hard enough, you know, the right thing will come uh, your way. And that's my, my third P is just people. Um, and especially as you're, you know, kind of getting started here in Washington, D.C., this is a very, very small town. Uh, and if I had, you know, I, I do remember I once, I don't think anybody knew, but I was extraordinarily hungover when I took, I used to take the metro at five in the morning <laughs> from here uh, to uh, NBC's offices, which were then up in Tenley Town. Um, and I was working for a guy who, you know, lo and behold, you know, five years later, that's where I, you know, finally got my break on the air, um, where I spent, you know, eight years of my career, worked with this guy every single day. Um, he is to this day one of my friends. Um, and it, it just sort of goes to show you, I mean, David and I have known each other, I, I mean, I don't know how many years, we've only now just started to work uh, at the same network, Gloria as well. The people that you get to know if you get your foot in in this, I mean, this is an industry town, so if you stay here and you work in the industry, um, politics, media, it's all connected, it's all intertwined, lobbying, the Hill, everybody knows each other. Um, and for two reasons, one, you know, try not to show up hungover to the internship, mm -hmm. not a great plan. Uh, but two, you know, these relationships are what are gonna get you your next job, right? And so you saying yes to that boss, you know, you figuring out what does my boss want from me and saying yes and building that relationship is gonna be what will get you your next thing. I mean, I've only ever gotten one job in my entire life from responding to a job posting and it was my very first internship at NBC News. Wow. Um, and ever since then, it's all about finding someone that you know who works at the next place, who knows your work, uh, and, and that really, I mean, it becomes, I think, more true as you get older in life, um, because, you know, the beginning when you're starting out, people are only gonna know you by your resume. Uh, but don't let those things um, lapse and, and, and really focus on them as you're getting started. Did you ever learn who the editor of The Crimson was that you were up against for that job? No, no I would really like to know, because I'm sure it works <laughs> in the media somewhere. <laughs> Uh, all right, I think that's going to do it. We're a little bit over time. Thank you guys so much uh, for being here tonight. We Thank really you. appreciate it.